Hi everyone, this is Steffi and welcome to The Financial Fox. Today we will be discussing something very important for us, which is data privacy. Most of us don't really realize the enormous impact that data has on our daily life, but they really should. We all should understand that. Experts are saying that data is the new oil to highlight its value and its power. But do we really realize this? The way we deal with data, we decide our future. And the world has been evolving very quickly, and the way we do things today is very different from the way that we used to do them 10 years ago. Now we can do everything online, using just using our smartphone, but having the world at our fingertips, it doesn't come without side effects. Actually, there are a lot of risks about acts and also about identity fraud. We are constantly exposed to this risk, and this is why it's very important that everyone knows, realize the value of data, and how we manage data, and how we share data. Because we shouldn't just share data for free. It can be really dangerous, and it is really scary. For this reason, we invited a very special guest today. He's a top data privacy influencer and digital marketer with an extensive knowledge of data protection. He has been featured on all the major media publications and is a TED talk about fear at the UC Irving, ranked number two by Inc. Magazine. With pleasure, let's welcome Leonard Kim. Hi, Leonard. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Stefania? I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm really happy to have you on the show to discuss this very interesting topic. Yeah, it's an extremely important topic if you really think about it, because when we think about data overall, all these little points, every single thing that we do on email, on Facebook, on social media, on Twitter, whatever it may be, these are all going, getting put into algorithms where there's machine learning and algorithms are really learning more details about exactly who we are and the horrible thing about it if we really think about it is this whole internet uh, sphere because of ISPs and other service providers and different technology companies they're getting to understand exactly who we are and all this data is compiling together to create a comp comprehensive profile of each and every single person who uses the internet and that ranges everywhere from health data all the way to our interests, to our concerns, the things we're thinking about and we're typing into search engines. And it kind of creates this perfect picture, a uh, mirror image of who we are as people in the digital realm. And when you really think about that, it can become quite scary. Exactly. Well, what are those data? Because everybody is kind of, lots of experts and many people are saying data is the new oil. But I don't think that actually everyone is, is actually realizing the value and the power of the personal data. So when we think about data at the most basic level, that's our name, our date of birth, uh, where we were born what city we're from, all essential information, but that migrates past that to like banking information, our social security information, to our likes, our interests, and the things that we really enjoy doing. When we kind of combine all that together and we create this more comprehensive profile of exactly who we are, like there might become points in time where you're thinking about maybe purchasing a car or maybe going out there and renting a new home. If you're a user of a big social media network or a search engine or email or things like that, chances are during these time frames, you begin to see ads that kind of resemble what you're going out there looking to purchase. And what they're doing is they're not just compiling data about exactly who you are, your credit score, where you're from and all of that. They're also tying that together with all of the interests that you're actually doing so then they can create this whole profile so they can predict when you want things at certain times. Have you ever like thought about or maybe typed into Google or had a conversation with a friend about maybe like a random product, like maybe the Exactly. And then the next, the next day you go, <laughs> that actually did happen to me because I was looking at some shoes. Um, and I don't think he even was online. I think he might be on a social network. And it was definitely, I was looking, I was passing by the shop. Anyway, I log in into a trading website. And uh, 
you know, there is some advertisement there and the shoes, the boots, they were there. And that was yeah. scary. Yeah, it's extremely scary. And it doesn't happen just by looking at things. You could have a conversation with your friend, have your phone next to you. And while you're talking about it, you go on to a search engine or social media networks. And within like two, three hours, you see an ad for the exact same thing. Yeah, exactly. But I mean, the thing is uh, that sharing those data, for instance, on different websites where you can subscribe and then you can get some advantages or um, you know you purchase something and you leave your data in a way sharing data nowadays is kind of giving you some kind of advantage some kind of a plus that's why people are kind of keen to share data but then what people should actually understand is that sharing those data is not just a plus for them eventually in discount or whatever could be the benefit is actually giving information that can be used, not against them, but can be kind of dangerous to be handed over. So, I mean, there's two ways to really think about going about this. One is you're like, okay, we're in a surveillance society. Our data is being used everywhere. Let me just share absolutely everything with the world. Now, most people, when they think about doing that, it's extremely scary because we have our biggest vulnerable moments, our, our darkest secrets. We don't really want to let those things get out into the atmosphere because if people actually knew, knew about them, what, what could happen? Maybe they could use that against us. Maybe that could prevent us from getting a job. Maybe if we had a health condition that we didn't share, that could prevent us from getting a new insurance with a healthcare provider so we can go out there and get the treatment that we're looking for, especially in America, where if you have pre, uh, where if you have a pre-existing condition, some healthcare providers might not help service your needs so then you can get those resolved. Now, when we think about it from a large scale, when all these companies out there have all this information about us, that it's not just health information, but our personal information as well, what could they actually do with those profiles? They can, one, sell those to other companies who are looking to earn more money. Uh, just recently, the California DMV, where I had to go to renew my driver's license, they've been uh, seen to sell data from everyone who registers for a license, and they collect about $50 million a year in doing so. $50 million a year has been is how the DMV, the government, is profiting off of our data. But we're here spending $36 to renew on that license. We're not getting any of that data money back. So we're going out there and we're willingly sharing our information with other people, and we're not even getting a cut of that. So that's why Andrew Yang says that data should be a private, uh, should be a property right. He says what uh, data is, it's something that should be owned as our property, just like our homes and everything else that we have. And the reason for that is because as time has progressed, we've been, give, well, we've been giving that data away, but we didn't know it was going to be sold. We didn't know it was going to be used. Exactly. And even, even if the company said, you know, we, we have a certain policy, they actually we are not sharing data. I mean, we saw what's happened with Cambridge Analytica. And you never know whatever, you know, for some kind of reason, this big tech company are actually going to share your data. Yeah, and as a marketer myself, I've been able to use a lot of that data out there where you can create retargeting campaigns, find people who have similar interests, go and narrow down on people who might have specific conditions so you can narrow down your target audience and get a message specifically in front of the people that you're looking to the target. Now, if you went back to maybe 10, 20 years ago, that would have been next to impossible to do. And the reason for that is while these companies are collecting more and more data about exactly who we are, we become profiled and then we get put into a little box. And those boxes become the golden ticket to really go out there and help these companies earn more money and maximize off the revenue that they're earning from knowing about you. And that becomes problematic in the long run because us as people, what we're becoming is we're becoming the product. We're losing our sense of privacy. We're losing exactly who we are. And the large corporations out there are kind of benefiting from this. Yeah, I kind of like this point that you made. That actually, you know, we people are going to become product, and that's that's yeah. really that's really scary. I mean, there is not just the marketing aspect. I mean, for for product, there is also the marketing aspect for politics, and we know that you know, gathering all this information it makes you a profile of a person that can be more influenced regarding a certain kind of 
political side or another political side. And that, that's, I think, is something that um, governments uh, and also regulators start to understand that that's why they are kind of pushing for so, pushing for to put some boundaries on social media. In the old time, if we really think about it, a lot of the wealth that was created by some of the biggest tycoons whose legacies still have, who still have billions of dollars nowadays, they spread that. Uh, they created their wealth based off of misinformation, betting against certain sides of wars, going out there and calling the shots and spreading lies so other people would believe one thing, hedging their bets, playing the markets and going out there and earning money when the other things happen. When you kind of understand exactly how a society or how the entire world operates, you can go out there and you can figure out exactly what it is that triggers someone what pushes a button, what their interests are. So you could go and spread misinformation that people buy into. And that's why fake news has become such a huge problematic issue where a lot of people are, it's hitting those touch points that really touch people, that really get them agitated, that really get them angry and get them to believe in a falsified message. And that's why Cambridge Analytica and other things like that could go out there and push elections to go into a different direction because there's that spread of, not just the misinformation, but understanding what data is going to go out there and trigger these people because you have a full understanding of their profile to get that fake information to really go and move people to, into a specific direction. And when you think about that, that, that's changing how societies work. That's changing the course and direction that we've worked so hard to go and put ourselves into one path and completely flip it around where now elections are being manipulated, where things aren't going the way we planned for it. And, so poor. It's so, I mean, it's so difficult because, uh, um, I mean, even if we know that, then we have to think, okay, wow, so then how, who, who we are going to trust, how we can, uh, you know, understand whatever is uh, true, whatever is fake news, and it's kind of very difficult, I think, for people out there to try to protect themselves from fake news. What will be your advice as, uh, you know, a data expert? Well, one of the things, if you really think about it, is fake news is baseless and they use poor research when they're really going out there and compiling their pieces together. You really have to, t like, I know about maybe five, ten years ago, when I used to read an article, I used to take it probably as factual because that information wouldn't probably exist online unless there was some basis behind it. But as more people are creating more and more misinformation, we have to look at the sources behind what's being created. Who was the person being interviewed? What are their interests? What, what, where do they come from? Are they doing, are they sharing information from personal experience, from data? Are they using research that's back from specific institutions that are large and trusted? Are they academic institutions? Are they for-profit institutions? Where is the data coming from that's compiling these pieces together? A lot of the content creators, the journalists, and the people who are creating things that the people read, they kept a very uh, nuanced position where you wouldn't lean left, you wouldn't lean right, you wouldn't put in your own opinion. You would state the facts of exactly what happened around an incident so people could draw their own conclusions. Nowadays, as smaller publications are able to go out there and create content, and there's no regulation behind these. Those journalists who have strict regulations on how to do everything, they've become less and less yeah. of the content producers. That's what makes it so difficult to distinguish what is good uh, data versus what is bad data online because it's so heavily opinionated. Exactly, and also, you know, the, the newspaper and the magazine and um, they are kind of the editorial, the space for editorial is so small that the most yeah. is advertisement. So double check the source, double check all the data, double check all the context that the data is put in. That's very important. Another thing that, you know, I wanted to have your opinion Opinion on is obviously we saw all this kind of regulation, the GDPR coming in, um, the the law in the EU, and and uh, you know how these kind of new regulation are trying to protect people data. Do you think companies really comply with the GDPR? And there are any other regulation that should be implemented? You think maybe next year or in the next couple of years? 
So it's not just in the UK where the uh, GDPR is happening. Over here in America, politicians are standing up and saying that data is very mishandled and it should be put under specific scrutiny. And more power should really go back to the people to really uh, have that data function in the proper way. But as anyone knows, anything that happens with the government happens extremely slowly. Then you have lobbyists and other people who kind of get involved to really go and craft that message out to, to tailor it to a different way. One example of that is the AB5 law over in California. That was intended to give Uber drivers a salary of, of about $30 an hour so then that they would be salaried employees instead of freelance employees. But now the lobbyists over at Uber are saying, you know what, that doesn't apply to us. For a writer, for example, if they wanted to go out there and contract with a large publication to create articles, normally they could do maybe five articles a month, 10 articles a month, 20 articles a month. And now they're limited to about, I think it's about 20, 15 or 25 that they can do every single month. Large companies end up having these huge teams of attorneys and lawyers who really go out there and fight these things and try to do their best to go out there and reserve their data rights so they can keep doing what they used to do with their data. So while it's a good attempt, it's not going to solve the underlying issue of the problem, which is our data is being mishandled and it's going to continue to be mishandled because uh, a long time ago, what ended up happening is someone had an idea that we should move into a surveillance state for the world and have a video camera. Um, the importance about data and how much do you care about data is, uh, you know, is what people actually should look and should consider. And also, you know, the blockchain element, which is kind of underpinning all these services to build up trust. Yeah, the blockchain, it's kind of interesting if you really think about it. Like, uh, in the last few years, I've seen a lot of my friends kind of moving into that direction and starting companies where they're working with blockchain, AI, machine learning, much like what we're doing over here at ZU. And even one of my friends, um, <clears throat> they have a company called Angel Hack, and they've been looking at a lot of the emerging tech. Uh, my friends who worked at that company under Sabine, they've been hopping into different blockchain industries, distributed ledger technologies. These are the people who are at the forefront of exactly where its technology is heading and the movements that they're making. And it's becoming crystal clear that blockchain, distributed, distributed ledger technologies, the apps, and all these other things, it's going to be the clear path to the Web 3.0 future that we're all moving towards. And because of that, what we really need to do is start recognizing how these technologies work now, getting involved with them now and becoming early. It kind of takes me back when the internet was first developed in the 1980s. Like my mom, she kind of thought about using it, but she never got around to. She never purchased a computer. She never learned those skills of exactly what it was and how those things work. And then now at the age of, uh, in her mid 60s, she's sitting there and she's barely learned how to use the internet. And it's kind of cut off her opportunities to go out there and sell in the job market, excel in different things. And if we see where DLTs and everything else is going, it's clear that this is going to be the future of where Web 3.0 is heading. So it's either A, learn how it works and get involved, B, use the services early because they're going to become standardized and the technologies of the past are no longer going to become relevant, or three, just watch all this happen and just let it all pass you by. <laughs> yeah, definitely, and be curious because you know you don't want to be left behind, as you said, yeah. it's, it's really true. Anyway, thank you so much, Leonardo, to be with us on the show today. It was a great chat. Uh, thank you so much, Stefania, for having me. It's a pleasure to be here and everyone for tuning in. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.